G'day, and welcome to Contextual History, the podcast powered by two cups of coffee and a tired set of eyeballs. This is part two of our exploration of the Qing, China's last imperial dynasty, which reigned from 1636 to 1912. This time, we'll be looking at a select overview of the shape of the Qing during the reign of the Chenglong Emperor, the longest de facto reigning monarch of the dynasty. For reference, Chenglong was the grandson of Kangxi, who, if you remember from last episode, was the emperor who defeated the revolt of the three feudatories who finally secured the rule of the Qing dynasty over China. He would come to power in 1735, succeeding his father, the Yongzhen Emperor, who had a short but productive realm of 12 years. Chenglong's reign of 61 years is often portrayed as the height of the Qing dynasty's power and prosperity. During his rule, China expanded, both militarily and psychologically, to encompass all of its modern territories, while the population reached more than double its highest point under the Ming. Despite this, a number of tensions that dated back to the rise of the Qing were still present in the period, foreshadowing the dangers that would eventually lead to the downfall of the dynasty. On a side note, Chenglong's reign is notable as something of a cultural golden age, with the flowering of poetry, paintings and literary works being sponsored by the imperial regime. Unfortunately, for the sake of succinctness, I won't be exploring this particular aspect here, but late Qing art and fashion is something probably worth its own episode one day. Of all the legacies of the Qing, perhaps the most long-lasting and evident is their redefinition of China's physical body. The heart of China, economically, culturally and politically, has long lain in the rich agricultural lands along the great waterways of the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers. Though Chinese dynasties were regularly able to project power beyond into the outlying areas, these were usually very peripheral to the interests of the core Han lands. Under the Qing, however, the conception of China broadened to include those areas and people living outside the Han majority. In other words, being Chinese no longer necessarily meant being Han. The idea of China had shifted from being a Han state with other subjects to a multicultural and multi-ethnic empire. This is a little more complex when you take in the fact that the idea of what is Han also shifted over time, but that's a subject for another time. This is perhaps best represented by the shifting language of the Qing. Initially, the Qing translated the Chinese word Dongguo, China, into Manchu as the state of the Han people. However, after the conquest of Beijing, this started to shift to simply the central state, or the Middle Kingdom. The advantages for the Qing were manifest from such a shift. As outsiders themselves, it meant that their rule was not delegitimized for being foreign, or at least that was the idea. Unsurprisingly, Chenglong was at the forefront of disseminating such a conception. In 1755, he pronounced, There exists a view of China according to which non-Han people cannot become China's subjects, and their land cannot be integrated into the territory of China. This does not represent our dynasty's understanding of China, but is instead that of the earlier Han, Tang, Song, and Ming dynasties. However, this was not the wording of a few imperial decrees, but was very much put into practice in the expansion of the empire. Whilst establishing themselves as emperors in China, the Qing rulers continued to be active participants in the Central Asian world they'd always been a part of, whereas their predecessors, the Ming, had been content to simply play various Mongol and Turkic tribes against one another by providing gifts, the Qing pursued an active policy of conquest in the north and west, particularly during Chenglong's reign. This was accomplished through the traditional methods of Central Asian foreign policy, a fluid mixture of gift-giving, marriage alliances, military subjugation, and genocidal suppression. That last option was included against the Dzungas, a nomadic people who had defeated Qing forces during the reign of Chenglong's father. Bolstered by the prestige and resources they possessed as rulers of China, their empire expanded deep into Central Asia, as far as the Tian Shan, Altai, and Himalayan mountain ranges. Today, these areas are the Chinese autonomous regions of Inner Mongolia, Xinjiang, Tibet, as well as the independent nation of Mongolia. When they weren't subjugating them, relations with outsiders were a complex and disjointed affair for the Qing dynasty. Unlike a modern nation, the empire had no equivalent to a department of foreign affairs. Rather than a single ministry that would deal with foreigners, responsibilities were divided among, up among several sections of the imperial bureaucracy. Generally, each section represents a particular management strategy for the Qing that served to defend the empire, either physically or morally, against outside threats, while emphasising the inferiority of those foreigners to the Middle Kingdom. The vast open territories of the North and West were managed by the Office of Border Affairs, 
staffed exclusively by Mantries and Mongols, their main task was preventing any threat from appearing in the same manner that the Qing themselves did. Importantly, it also involved keeping an eye on Russian settlers and Cossacks to make sure they stayed on their side of the agreed frontier. Controlling such lands involved managing relations between the tribes and nomadic peoples, garrisoning the strategic cities that lay on the caravan trade routes, and protecting those same caravans for the predations of bandits. To the Ministry of Rituals was given the task of overseeing the conduct of foreign embassies giving tribute to the Emperor. Given China's restrictive trade policies, this was one of the few ways outside powers could access the enormous wealth of the Empire. Rulers in neighbouring areas such as Myanmar, Thailand and Korea would send missions to the imperial capital bringing material tribute, often with an, along with an official declaration of fealty to the Chinese Emperor. Supplicants would then be granted official recognition as vassals and would be allowed to engage in limited trade. For the most part, the actual influence of the empire in these foreign kingdoms was often quite limited, both because of the distance and a simple lack of interest on the part of the Chinese. Exceptions to this occur when the interests of the empire were felt to be under threat. For example, during the late Ming dynasty, large numbers of ships and soldiers were sent to Korea to aid the alien Joseon dynasty against the Japanese invasion. During the Qing dynasty, the suzerainty of China over her neighbours was involved several times, notably in a beginning in a Vietnamese succession crisis, and several invasion attempts into Myanmar, which were ultimately unsuccessful. Despite these outliers, China's neighbours had much to gain for nominally subjugating themselves to the empire. Tribute missions and the cross-border trade they enabled were extremely lucrative, and a chance to display the givers' wealth and prestige, with missions often composed of hundreds of individuals, giving tribute to serve simultaneously as a chance to increase the ruler's legitimacy and to curry favour with the hegemonic power of East Asia. From the perspective of the Qing, it also served as an important legitimising mechanism, both for the dynasty and for the entire Chinese worldview. Placing itself at the centre of the world, the Middle Kingdom was perceived as the preeminent state and the emperor the rightful lord of all under heaven. The further from the borders of China, the more barbaric and unworthy in the interactions with the foreigners became. The tribute system represented a chance for barbarians to come and submit themselves to the centre of the world, the Chinese emperor. Thus, while simultaneously a mechanism for controlled outside contact and trade, it also served a moral and political purpose in maintaining a Sinocentric worldview. The Chinese relationship with Japan bears a quick note because it did not fit the same pattern of formal subjugation. Only inconsistently a formal tributary of the Ming, the Japanese were on the edge of the Chinese world, both physically and diplomatically. Even during a period of tributary relations in the 14th century, the ruling Ashikaga shogunate was restricted from sending a mission any more than once every 10 years. For comparison, the Korean kingdom, something of a model tributary in the Chinese view, was allowed to conduct tribute missions three times a year during the same period. Even this was considered controversial in the Ashikaga court, whom eventually halted the flow of tribute missions. Despite this, Japanese culture, religion, and language were all enormously influenced by Chinese. Particularly anything considered high culture was an import from the Chinese, usually by way of Korea. Poetry, song, dress, and philosophy were all symbols of status for Japanese elites, even if they were not entirely willing to subordinate themselves for easier access to them. By the reign of Chunlong, all formal contact between the two had ceased, with Japanese refusal to play by the rules of the Chinese tributary system. While they were not totally isolated from each other, having contact by proxy through Korea and the Ryukyu Islands, the Qing had little concern for the island chain nation on the edge of Asia. However, the Japanese were not the only foreigners who didn't quite keep to the accepted standards of Chinese international relations. From the mid-16th century onwards, Portuguese and other Europeans arrived seeking to trade and preach Christianity in China. With the exception of some new firearm designs, the newcomers did not have much to offer the Chinese. Their habits were repulsive, their manners rude and uncivilized, and their goods poor and unwanted. While they were allowed to conduct trade, it would be done in a characteristically controlled manner. They would only be allowed to trade at the single port of Guangzhou, and could only enter the city for half of each year. The rest of the time, they would either have to leave China, or be confined to the enclave of Macau. In addition, there were strict rules surrounding interacting with Chinese residents, and could only conduct trade through a small number of officially recognised merchants, the Kohong. While the Europeans that came to Guangzhou were interested in getting rich and returning home, they still chafed under these tight restrictions. 
It was towards the end of the reign of Chenglong, then, that a fascinating exchange took place over these trade restrictions. With an increasing number of European merchants hungry for luxury Chinese goods, the British East India Company dispatched an embassy to seek the audience of the Emperor. Led by one Lord George McCartney, the mission carried many expensive gifts designed to display the status of Britain as an advanced world power. The goals of the embassy were broad-ranging, centering around transforming the relationship between the two parties to a more equal stance. They included ending the Kohong system and the opening of new ports for international commerce, the establishment of a British ambassador to Beijing, and the introduction of fairer tariffs. Arriving at Guangzhou in June 1793, they were allowed to proceed to Beijing in order to help celebrate Chang'ong's 80th birthday. The audience did not go well. McCartney refused to prostrate himself full length for the emperor did in the ritual kowtow, only managing a kneel and a series of bows. Thoroughly unimpressed by this barbarian tributary mission, Chung Long blankly refused every request from McCartney, sending him away with a missive for King George. The final section of this letter reads as follows. If, after receipt of this explicit decree, you lightly give it out to the representations of your subordinates and allow your barbarian merchants to proceed to Zhongjing and Tianjin with the object of landing and trading there, the ordinances of my celestial empire are strict in the extreme, and the local officials, both civil and military, are bound reverently to obey the law of the land. Should your vessels touch the shore, your merchants will assuredly never be permitted to land or to reside there, but will be subject to instant expulsion. In that event, your barbarian merchants will have had a long journey for nothing. Do not say that you were not warned in due time. Obey tremblingly and show no negligence. What's most interesting about this exchange is its thoroughly one-sided nature. Despite the efforts of the British to impress their power and dignity, their requests were simply dismissed. That's reflective of the power of the Qing dynasty by the time of Chang'ong's rule. The base of that power rested on the cultivation of internal stability. Enough time had passed for the wounds of the late Ming dynasty and the conquest to heal. By the time of Chang'ong's reign, the population had doubled from its highest point under the Ming. By all indications, whilst Chang'ong's army were busy expanding China's borders, internally, the population expanded too. This drove the opening of previously uncultivated lands, as the growing population required arable land for food. Cultivated in lands in China as much as doubled, with the average caloric intake increasing as well. This difference in food production is certainly due to the introduction of new crops originating in the Americas, part of the massive ecological shift known as the Columbian Exchange. Here, peanuts, potatoes, sweet potatoes, and maize became commonly planted, offering new sources of nutrition that could be grown in otherwise marginal soils. However, this increasing population pressure led to conflict in southern areas like Guangxi and Yunnan. These areas, previously seen as rough backwaters by officials, began to receive more attention in the mid-Qing period, roughly just before Chang'ong's reign, as increasing numbers of Han settlers arrived. Resenting being driven out of their land by the settlers, local peoples fought back against dispossession, which are usually recorded as Mao rebellions in Chinese records, Mao being a Chinese term for a broad group of peoples living in the southwest areas of China. The final result was a forceful suppression of these groups by Qing forces, and the opening of the areas for Han settlement, a process that bears striking resemblance to colonial conquests happening simultaneously in the Americas and Australia. Of particular importance to any government is one thing, tax revenue, and the means to collect that. Chang'e's father, Yongzhen, had presided over a series of tax reforms, expanding the power of the Qing state into people's lives. The governments of the various Chinese dynasties had long governed through an enormous structure of state bureaucracy. This was administered by a class of scholar officials who gained position through an extremely competitive system of examinations. Scholars hoping to gain imperial employment were tested rigorously on the details of Confucian classics, which were viewed as the basis for moral and effective government. Failure was an exceedingly common occurrence, with many applicants spending decades studying and, re and repeatedly attempting the exams. Successful applicants would join the prestigious ranks of the Shi, the scholar officials, and be assigned to a position based on their scores. The benefits of Shi status were quite extensive. They included lifetime government pensions, immunity from physical punishment, 
and positions of authority and social prestige. The cream of the crop who achieved the highest ranking, the Jinshe, could expect a prestigious position in either the provinces or the imperial capital. Theoretically, this meant that anyone not restricted from entering the examinations could rise to become one of the most powerful figures in China. However, the situation was not quite as meritocratic as it sounds. Women, criminals, and members of another of other groups could not enter. Furthermore, only those who could afford to support themselves or a family member through the long years of education required could hope to enter the ranks of the ship. This excluded the vast majority of the peasantry who could neither afford to pay for the schooling or forgo the labour of a family member. This meant that many of the successful examinees were relatives of other shi, making the whole structure semi-hereditary. In addition, while the jinshi could expect lives of prestige and privilege, those at the bottom of the hierarchy did not necessarily have it easy. Many a low-ranking official spent life languishing away in poor paying positions, unable to rise up the ranks while having to support relatives and maintain the cultivated and refined lifestyle expected of shi. It should come as no surprise, then, that corruption was a constant temptation. With the broad-ranging autonomy that many officials had in local areas, it could be relatively simple for tax surpluses to simply disappear into the pockets of officials. It was also commonplace practice for local landholders to bribe officials to reduce their tax burden. Yongzheng's tax reforms attempted to address these issues by appointing officials trusted by the emperor to the highest positions of authority within the provinces, who communicated personally with the emperor. This elite circle would then oversee the detailed assessment of local areas, encouraging honesty by distributing a portion of surpluses back into the salary of local officials. Generally, these tax reforms were most successful in the densely populated north, where the relatively high proportion of people and property, compared to the officials, meant that each official got a larger slice of the pie. These measures both increased imperial revenue and cut out corruption amongst the lower bureaucracy. Yongzheng's methods of government were continued by his son, Chenglong's personal correspondence with his direct underlings are fascinating, not just because they give direct insights into the governance of the late mid-Qing, but also into the tensions that bubbled away under the surface. As much of the dynasty had time to settle down, the precarious act of attempting to balance being both rulers of the Han-majority China and preserving their unique Manchuness had never really gone away. Many imperial policies were enacted with an eye on keeping this balance in check. The imperial court was semi-mobile, while normally located in Beijing, during the summer it would move outside of the Great Wall to Chunde, a bit over 100 kilometers to the northeast of Beijing. This was in order to keep the emperor and his retainers connected to the Manchu origin of their ancestors. Here they would practice archery and participate in large-scale hunts in the manner of their forebears. In addition, the entire homelands of the Manchu in the northeast were sealed off from Han settlers. While the empire's population was burgeoning, and these areas were fertile and ripe for cultivation, it was decided that these traditional lands would be reserved strictly for the members of the banners. The Qing bannermen, scattered across the empire and the garrisons, were the focus of this imperial scrutiny. They were expected to remain aloof from local populations around them, as fraternising with Han could encourage assimilation. They were expected to practice archery and horsemanship regularly, whilst policies were enacted to encourage the use of Manchu language. Notably, Bannermen would receive preferential consideration for the imperial examinations if they wrote their essays in the Manchu script. The effectiveness of these strategies was something of a mixed bag. While the imperial court could play at living as Jurchen Khans, they did so while still accessing the luxury and comforts of an imperial residence. The restriction on settling in the northeast was effectively enforced during Chang'e's reign, but that meant little when the lives of Bannermen were centred around their garrison communities across China. While their distinct social position could be relied upon to keep banner members at least somewhat apart from their Han neighbours, they would still absorb cultural norms and language from living in China. Thus, while it would be still easy to distinguish Manchus living in a city like Nanjing or Guangzhou, it would not be because they were speaking Manchu, but rather that they were speaking the Mandarin Chinese used in the imperial court in contrast to whatever the local dialect was. On the flip side of the coin, the foreign origin of the dynasty was something of a sensitive topic when it came to, le to the legitimacy of their rule. Whilst sufficient time had passed to allow the dynasty to face down open threats as the virtuous and correct Confucian monarchy, the origins of the Qing were not exactly hidden. However, openly acknowledging this fact seemed to be something of a faux pas, lest the dynasty be considered lesser for not being Han. 
even in private correspondence between Chenlong and Manchu officials, the issue is sidestepped, with laws like the wearing of cues being delicately referred to as policies of this dynasty. The interest of the Qing in maintaining prosperity and stability was then very high. Any failure to do so would prove the ugly belief that lurked below the surface, that because the dynasty was foreign, it would prove illegitimate. Therefore, though Chenglong's reign was long and seemingly prosperous, whenever tensions seemed to about to emerge, his bureaucratic machine would quickly step in to smooth things over. This is most clearly and fascinatingly illuminated by a collection of otherwise minor incidents that soon escalated into a multi-province witch hunt. In the year 1768, several unrelated men were arrested in different provinces across central China. They were all accused of sorcery, that is, of using magic to steal the souls of others, and then to use those souls for other nefarious ends. This was bad for just about everyone, though in modern times it can be easy to dismiss such ideas as superstitious. For common people living in 18th century China, fear of supernatural predation was a very real and terrifying threat. Chinese philosophy held that humans were composed of two primary components, the earthly, corporeal, Po soul, and the spiritual and airy Hun soul. When the Hun was stolen away, it was believed that the owner would be left to waste away, losing all vitality and desire to live. Not exactly a desirable fate. For the Qing government, it was worse. It represented a very real threat to the stability and continued rule of the dynasty. Though the official stance on the existence of sorcerers was dismissive, the common people believed that they existed, and a dynasty that allowed such evildoers to prey upon their subjects could hardly expect to remain being seen as the rightful rulers for very long. Even more so, one of the more popular methods that was believed sorcerers employed to separate souls from their owners was by cutting away pieces of clothing, or, notably, hair. Some of the accused were indeed found with clipped lengths of queue, as well as blades and scissors. If there really were people going around central China cutting off people's queues, the symbol of their loyalty and submission to the rule of the Qing, it certainly could not be tolerated. Even if they were not sorcerers, they could well be anti-Qing dissidents looking to make a message. Thus it was that Chenlong and his highest circle of officials took a personal interest in overseeing the investigation of sorcerers. However, Quickly, more and more reports began to appear of sorcerers attempting soul theft, with public rumour quickly turning to the idea that a shadowy cabal of master sorcerers were orchestrating a grand scheme behind the scene. Local officials pressured from below by a fearful populace, and from above by increasingly demanding superiors, worked desperately to hunt down suspected sorcerers. Worse was that no puppet masters could be found. Those who were arrested were seemingly pawns, a mix of destitute monks, out-of-work labourers, and drifters seeking employment, who all admitted to taking instruction in sorcery from mysterious masters who could not be located. And the reports continued to spread, soon appearing in the capital itself. However, even at the height of the hysteria, questions were emerging about whether there had even been any sorcery done at all. Those who had admitted to sorcery were usually social outcasts, and their confessions, as they were, were typically extracted via torture. When taken to Beijing for cross-examination, they would recant, vowing the presence of the servants of the imperial household that they had never attempted sorcery, nor met any master sorcerers. In addition, those discovered with clip cues were generally found to be made of animal hair, used as charms or for selling as hair extensions. Eventually, pressure to locate sorcerers was dropped, and reports of cue clipping and sorcery, as well as the resultant public fears, died away. What to make of the whole episode, then? Why did a sorcery craze even spring up, if no person ever certain of attempting it was ever found? The most probable answer lies in those who were accused of the crime. The outcasts. China's population, booming as it was, was increasingly creating a larger and larger class of people unable to make a living in the places of their birth. This, combined with parallel issues of uncontrolled deforestation and erosion in the upriver provinces, drove formerly agricultural people into the downriver provinces of central China seeking employment. 
These areas with their own burgeoning in populations were the grounds of increasingly large competition for employment. In such conditions, it was only a matter of time before social tensions broke. In this case, in the hysteria over the fear of supernatural predation. For the Qing, the situation was ultimately survivable. They had managed to dance past the frightening conception of an empire in social and economic turmoil. Fascinating as the soul stealer craze of Chenlong's reign is, it was only a regional concern, not an empire threatening crisis, just a taste of worse things to come. Chenlong would officially abdicate in 1796, though it would remain the real power in the empire until his death in 1799. Though initially prosperous, the end of his reign was characterized by stagnation in economic matters and a regrowth of corruption. In many ways, the apparent success of his long reign was merely a result of his forebearers and his subordinates' efforts, such as in the case of tax reforms of his father. Whether Chongong was really a successful or even competent ruler is somewhat questionable. However, his rule is still seen as the zenith of the power and prosperity of the Qing dynasty, in a contrast to what would come after. In the decades that would follow his death, China would enter the area that would radically transform the fate and the shape of the nation, the so-called century of humiliation. Join me next time as I attempt to break down the final century of Qing rule as we explore the events of the 19th century. Until then, goodbye and farewell.